This is the Floridaville. Get to know the people behind the Florida names you know. I'm your host, Rosanna Catalano. On this episode, we get to know Colette Hardeman. She is a self-taught artist who is known for celebrity drawings and dramatic renderings of fish and animals. But she's probably best known for her murals. In Tallahassee alone, there are about 70 pieces of wall art scattered throughout the city. Colette's strong personality is reflected in her bold art. We are live video streaming today's episode remotely. I'm in my home office in Tallahassee, and Colette is speaking to us from her home in Tallahassee as well. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I came to know your art by driving through downtown Tallahassee. There is the Rosie, the Riveter mural, the ceiling smashers, and so many others. Do you have a favorite? They each hold a moment in time for me. Um, The most recent one is probably the deepest meaning right now. It's the Justice Mural with um, seven civil rights activists on Annabelle Diaz Law Firm downtown. And that one um, fits the time that we're in right now. That's a beautiful piece. I've seen you post that on your social media channels. Absolutely beautiful. You You have quite the following on social media. Tell us how you became so popular. Oh, God. (laughs) Uh, You know, it started very organically. Um, I I only I I knew that videos were working. So I posted time lapse videos of me doing the renderings, but only showing my hands because I was still scared uh, of social media and skeptical of showing who I was because I wanted the art to be the focal point and not me or or who I was. And it started very organically. People liked the video and they were like, wow, you did all that in two minutes. No, it took two hours. But, you know, it started a conversation and it I built confidence and I started to post all of my artwork. And then I found like minded people that enjoyed what I was posting and it they would invite their friends and we would do um, act of kindness giveaways. I would give away shirts if you post that you did an act of kindness. I would do, I painted the soup kitchen with 60 kids. Uh, I did a co-host of that with Fun Vitale Kids. And so it just started to gain momentum by inviting people in. That's nice to have something very inclusive to work <laughs> and to work yeah. well. If people wanted to see your work and follow you on social media, where should they go? Artwork and me. I have a live stream into my studio at least normally about six days a week. I'm painting in my studio so you can actually talk to me and see me real time. Um, I simulcast that on four channels, two Facebooks, YouTube and Twitch under Colette Originals on all of those. Um, but if they're wanting to see my murals, I created an app. It's Colette Originals and it's free in the Google app and iPhone Play Store, Apple Store, you can find the map uh, of all of the murals that I painted around town and you can post a selfie of you at the at the mural, a selfie spot. So it just depends on what you're what you're look what you're looking for. If you want to find me, I'm on Facebook. If you want to find the murals, the app will help you kind of look. Oh, that's so fun. I'm going to try that. I've always wanted to see you sort of all your apps. I mean, excuse yeah. me, all of your, all of your mirrors. I mean, there's all of the ones that will not get you in trouble to go see <laughs> on the map. <laughs> so there's schools, there's a church, um, there's some little kids' bedrooms. You're not going to find those on the app, but if they're publicly <laughs> accessible, I put them on there. Um, because a lot of my friends from high school and college growing up, they would come back to visit Tallahassee and they asked me for this master list. And with the master list constantly growing, I use an app development company to kind of just add them into the map and take over the reins for that for me. So now my friends who come into town can just kind of look and see, okay, and you get a notification. There's hot spots on there. So if you drive by, I think it's a mile and a half is the geofence around them. You'll get notified that you're close to a Colette Original mural as well. Uh, I will annoy you either through Facebook or through the app. You'll know I've been there. I like the geofencing. That's a nice touch. So although you were born and raised in Florida and currently live here, I know there are some big changes on the horizon for you. Can you tell us what you have planned? Yeah, uh, actually, July 6th. Oh, God, I I panic every time I look at the date because it's getting closer. July 16th, I am relocating to Austin, Texas. Um, I will be a woman of two cities at that point because my mother will stay here and I have contracts in December and July that I'll come back to fulfill here. So I'll be splitting time between Texas and Florida at that point. Well, I'm going to pause right here and we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll come back and ask you a bit about your childhood. This episode 
episode of The Floridaville is brought to you by Rocket Ship Consultants. Let us help you launch your career, your business, your podcast, or your live stream. Follow us on Facebook and on Instagram and visit our website at www.rocketshipconsultants.com. So Colette, were you artistic as a child? I was. My dad wanted me to be an athlete. So um, I, my main focus was on basketball and track. Outside of that, when I had downtime, it was always a book, a pencil. Um, normally pencils. Pencils are what I gravitated to. My dad was colorblind. So anytime I got into painting, it, it wasn't as successful. I didn't get that pleasure that I would get when I did a black and white. So I focused more on those. And I think it carried on through school, just taking the art elective classes. I made sure that if you had a chance to choose an elective, um, that it was that, not choir, band. I wasn't a big band person. Did art serve a different purpose for you besides just drawing when you were a child? Yeah, so um, I had a troubled childhood. Uh, my, my dad was an alcoholic, and it, it just became a very toxic family environment. So art became a refuge. Um, it also became a way to diffuse the bomb. So if you have somebody that's kind of chaotic or sporadic, or very volatile, have you, you go up to them and you're five years old and you show them a pretty painting, all of a sudden it's like a, a, a light switch went off and he changed. Um, so mom and dad are fighting and you present your artwork. So it was therapy for me. I also saw it as a way of calming for others. At that point, I was able to recognize that it was a good deflection. So art has always been present in that form for me. I did some research on you before this interview, and I know that you lost your dad in an accident when you were a teenager. How did that loss impact your life? Um, I wasn't expecting to get emotional with that one. It was hard. Uh, Dad uh, was homeless when he passed away, and it was his second day on a job. He walked onto a construction job, and it was his second day, and uh, he fell eight feet, three inches off of a scaffold and died. Um, he had an alcohol induced seizure because he was trying to get clean. He was trying to better his life, get a job and make things right. And so when you look at the accident as profound as it was, and then you dissect what actually happened and how his story was when it happened, where he was at in life and what he was trying to accomplish. I, 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 it pains me to this day. Um, as we'll talk about later, I'm sure I have seen addiction in every facet, in every role. I've been the wife to an addict, the daughter to an addict, and I've been the addict. And so it troubles me because, you know, there's always, what could I have done differently? Could I have shown him a different picture that would made him drink? Could I have painted his favorite musician? Whatever it is. But dad's loss uh, pained me deeply still does. I'm so sorry to hear that story. I, I just can't even imagine. What advice would you give to someone who's witnessing a loved one succumbing to unhealthy addiction? This is not a popular opinion. And every I used to when I came out about being clean, when I was a year clean, two years clean, um, I used to have a lot of addicts reach out to me. And now more than ever, I get the family of addicts reach out to me. And my advice to them is all the same. If you love an addict and they are hurting you, they have not hit rock bottom because they know that you will help them. You have to grieve an addict like they're dead and you have to continue to live your life. And at that point, that addict knows they're on their own and they have to make a decision because we can't identify when our rock bottoms are. Um, but as long as, for instance, me, if I knew I could lean on my mom, if I knew I could hurt my mom enough for her to help me, if I could love her enough, if I could somehow influence her to dig me out of whatever trouble I'd gotten into at this point, then I was not at rock bottom. I always had a lifeline. So when I talk to people who have addicts in their life, I give them permission to live, permission to go on and be happy because my my decisions should not influence yours. You should live the best life that you are capable of regardless of mine. And so a lot of moms that I speak to and I tell them it's, it's okay to live. You didn't do this to your addict. It's a mental disease. I firmly believe that it's it, our minds are broken. We have OCD and we're obsessed with something, but it's nothing that you did to us. So, I mean, a lot of moms are feeling that they can get hug and kiss it away. Um, like somehow they can get their baby back. And by all means they can, but we, you can't hold our hands through it. So it, it, like I said, it's not a popular opinion, but you have to sever ties with addicts so that they're pushed to do better. That's got to be incredibly hard and difficult for a family member. <laughs> it absolutely is. Uh, you know, 
my mom did this with my dad. And so I, I saw it then when I went to rehab, I didn't have any visitors. I didn't have family coming to rescue me. I didn't have them bringing me, you know, these little gifts, putting money into the till for me to buy things. I was on my own. And something about that was, it, it made me feel alive again. Like, okay, Colette, you've, you've really got to muster up and fix this, you know? And so in order for me to reach my full potential, I had to walk that journey alone. And I, I, I think it hurt me then but at least I was feeling something. I was numb for so many years. The pain of not having my mom or grandmother around made me feel alive in a very sick way. It was feeling something. And so I wouldn't have changed their presence during my rehabilitation at all. I needed to go through that to feel that. And I can't say that I, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to even say what I think will fix anybody. But I do know that if if they were close with me, I would have felt enabled and kept going. So you've been very open about your prior addiction. And can you let people know, I guess, a little bit more about your addiction and how severe it was? Sure. So I um, I lost my dad when I was 16 and I dabbled in drugs. Um, back then it was ecstasy, cocaine, things like that. I didn't know how to be normal. Mind you, I grew up in a toxic environment, so I didn't know how to be quiet. I didn't know how to not yell. I didn't know how to fit in. Um, and so those things were crutches for me to feel social. Later in life, after you go through the college partying phase and you, you, you dabble in drugs and you do the 70s hippie thing and all of that, you know, and you try to ask it, which I find out now, mind you, is not normal for everyone. But uh, later in life, I had my daughter through a cesarean. And uh, what ended up happening and transpiring over the next three years is I had four abdominal surgeries and opiates were introduced to my life. And those were game changers to me. It was not like cocaine. It was not like alcohol. They were heroin. They were, it was, it's a lot. It was synthetic heroin. And it was like a warm hug. It was the best thing ever. It made me feel whole and happy for once. And so I leaned into it. And when it, being a strong minded and a strong personality as I am, when I found time that I wanted to put these things down, my body would not allow me to. Um, I was physically addicted. And so the chemicals were necessary to live at that point. And I think that's when the addiction really set in. From 27 to 33, I hit it hard. And then when you go through opiates, uh, you go to pain clinics and the pain clinics give you your dose. And then you run out early and you smoke meth because you're sick, you're vomiting, you're throwing up, you're next to death, and you're still having to raise children. Um, and nobody can know. So you do whatever it is to let you feel normal. And then the pills weren't enough. So you start uh, doing it. I started intravenous drug use. I was shooting them up at this point because they weren't getting me high enough. My body was getting so used to them. And so heroin came next. It was the perfect storm of uh, not dealing with childhood trauma, being in a horribly abusive marriage and, and just being alone, even though I was surrounded by people, I felt really alone and I didn't know who I was. I had banded, abandoned art at this point too. So there was a good 12 years I wasn't painting or doing anything, but um, pharmaceutical pills and, and um, drug therapy that I was in for surgery started it until it got to the more illicit street drugs. And I was shooting up 40 times a day. If I didn't have actual drug to put in the syringe, I was shooting up water. I can identify now that in a toxic childhood, I felt like I needed pain. Um, so the mode of uh, application of the drug for me using needles was just as much about sorrow and um, depression as it was the chemical usage. It was me needing to hurt myself. Um, and so a lot of therapy happened in rehab, but I, it was bad, it was toxic. And um, I hit rock bottom when I was 33. And I told my mom, I was like, you got to watch the kids. I've got to go to rehab. Well, thank you for being so courageous and honest yeah. um, with the struggles that you had. I think for a lot of people, you know, they think of a heroin addict or any kind of drug addict as someone that has a life completely different from their own, that they yeah. will be able to spot an addict on site. Mm -hmm. But you know, you had mentioned you owned a home and you had children and kept a job. Right. Can you explain that? Yeah. So, I mean, the first question is if you, you think you don't know somebody who's done heroin, if you know somebody who has had surgery, you know somebody who has done heroin. 
the lot is synthetic heroin. There is people out there right now that are taking opioids that are way too strong. Um, so they're out there. There you probably love them. They're your family. The pharmaceutical companies are putting way too strong chemicals out there for people. But how does it work? Well, there becomes a certain point in our lives as an addict where recreation becomes actual medicine. A dose is what we need in order to be normal. And you don't know that we're not normal because you only know what we're presenting to you. And so for me, I'm an introvert. I like to stay at home in my studio. I like to paint. I like to be by myself. And that's me. But when I went out, people had no idea that I wasn't there normal. They didn't know that I was under the influence. We don't act wacky. We don't act drunk. We don't slur. It, it's a dose that we're providing ourselves. Again, at this point, after seven years of, of opioid and heroin use, when you dose, you're not getting high anymore. You're really just functioning. Um, and so people just, they don't know. And, and I will tell you when I started to go to Narcotics Anonymous, and I won't say who, one of my doctors was in Narcotics Anonymous with me. We are out there. We are business owners. We're, we're people that are doing things. We're active in the society. Clean or still in active addiction. There is a very large amount of people that are using something to get by. And you'll, you'll never know. It's, it's, it's that old adage of not knowing if your neighbor is being a, a victim of domestic violence because they hide it so well. We hide it. It is what it is. We hid it. You got the help you needed when you were 33 years old. What made the difference for you so that you could finally get better? Um, I was married at the time. Um, it was a very bad, bad marriage. But um, I looked at him and I said, you know, we need to quit. We have kids. And he says, you can. I'm not. I said, OK, I am. Only I couldn't. Uh, I removed him from the house and I tried to kick uh, and get better for about six to nine months. I had the doctor put me on methadone and I tried and I was able to end the needle addiction. I was able to end that. But then I just switched to drinking and then I just switched. I ended up going back to crack. Um, it was at that point I started going and checking into TMHBC's uh, detox, no, Appalachian Detox Center. And I would go in there and say, Mom, watch the kids for the weekend. I'm going to go try to detox at uh, Appalachian. And um, God, I'd go in there for two or three days. And then the very next day when I get out, the day I spent one night at home clean and I, my skin would crawl. I didn't know how to be clean. I would use, I'd pick up. And so this went on uh, four times. I went into detox over those nine months after leaving my ex-husband. And then I realized that um, it wasn't him. It wasn't the substance. It was me. Something in my brain was very broken. And I needed to figure out what that was. And so the fourth time that I went into detox, uh, they didn't have a bed available at Sisters in Sobriety. And I waited there. I waited there for 10 days until somebody graduated so I could get in. And I went into Sisters in Sobriety and it changed my life. It was horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible, but it was beautiful. I needed it. I needed to hate it. So I didn't go back. And that was my clean date, October 21st of 2014. Congratulations. Thank you. Did art play a role in your rehab? You know, every time somebody asks me that, I, I, I go back to Muhammad Ali and the shaking hands that he has. Um, had, I picked up a pencil in rehab and started drawing again. And my hands shook vibrant. I mean, it was horrible. It, it was a sputtering engine. They just shook so badly. But I knew I was going to have to reacclimate to society. So I needed to train my hands. Um, and so I picked up my pencil and I started drawing a, a girl. One of my older sisters in rehab just lost her father. So I drew a picture of her father. And I saw that joy that I put on my dad's face when I was five, when I gave her this photo. And she cried. She still, we stay in contact now. And so I started drawing. And then uh, they had... Um, lack of funding for art therapy. So I asked the counselor, I said, can I do an art therapy class? And she said, yeah. So I got my little hat on, my professor's hat, you know, metaphorically speaking, went on the internet and Googled what I could about art therapy. And so I, all before I knew it, I had all of the sisters in sobriety, we were doing art therapy. And I don't know. It, yeah, it found me. I found it. I had to go through the muck to get back to art. But it was funny because part of rehab is they require you to go back to work. And I was like, Shit, I, I know how to work. I need to work on me. Um, and so I waited until the very last couple of weeks in uh, 
rehab. I was there for six months to find a job, which later being Macy's. And I, I just focused on me and every book they wanted me to read, everything they wanted me to write, every essay, I did them all. It was, I think we had six classes a day of some type of therapy. Uh, and I worked through it. And when I came out the other side, I started working at Macy's. I kept drawing. Now, at this point, I'm free in society. I have my kids back. We're living with my mom, though, because I still needed a babysitter in my mind. I needed I needed to have some type of caretaker in my life just to make sure accountability partners probably. So uh, I, I'm back at Macy's working now and I don't fit in anywhere. So after hours going to the club, going to the movies, going to, to get drinks, none of that existed in my life. That was that was weird business. So I'd come home and I'd draw. So the drawing I did in rehab, I continued in the evening and I just kept drawing. And that's when I opened my social media, social media account. It was back in 2015. I started Facebook and I started posting these little videos and pictures that I was drawing. That's amazing. <laughs> you, I hope you're proud of yourself. No, I, it's not. It's not anything I'm doing. It, I mean this in the most genuine sense. It's something that's happening to me. I, this is all happening. It's all very fluid and happening. I'm just a vehicle for this artwork, but it's therapy that you're watching. It's every day. You just saw me cry. I'm okay crying on stream. I'm okay laughing. And I don't know. It's just happening to me. I haven't stopped to be proud. That's not something that I think is in my vocabulary. Well, maybe after this, you'll take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we like to end our show with a little fun by asking all of our guests the same seven questions. What would people be surprised to know about you? I have, uh, I'm very good at math. I have OCD. We've diagnosed that now. <laughs> and so math is one of my favorite things in the whole world. It's not emotional. It's factual. It's always the same, you know. And I think another thing that people are shocked to know is I always have these on most of my life, regardless of streaming, because I have a phobia of sounds, certain sounds um, bother me. And that links into my anxiety and OCD. So the weirdest thing, <laughs> I can't hear my own voice. It's weird. So when there's playbacks on stream, I never watch those. So when you have guests in town, where is your favorite place to take them? Oh, that hasn't happened in months. <laughs> but the junction on South Monroe. You know, I like to tell people it's across. If you're from Tallahassee, they used to have this old paradise down in Midtown where they played great music and you go dancing on the back deck. And then there's BBC on the north side, Brass and Blues Club. So the Junction's the perfect uh, blend of both of those. They play great music. The acoustics are beautiful. The crowd is my age and a little bit older where I fit in. Um, so the Junction on Monroe is one of my must hit lists. Fabulous. I'll have to check it out. I was oh, a fan yeah. of Paradise back in the day. <laughs> it's like that. I mean, it, it's like that. What is the name of a book you recently read that you could not put down or the name of a show you enjoyed binge watching? There's a book. It's called How to Steal Like an Artist. And I think it was just it's it's almost cheeky, but it is so true. And that most artists, including myself, we reinvent what's already been done, but we do it with our signature. Um, so How to Steal Like an Artist is one of the best books I've read. That sounds like a fun book. Among your close family and friends, what are you best known for? Uh, I would say art. Little known fact that the, I can cook. I just refuse to. <laughs> I enough. love to cook, but I hate the time that it takes. So I don't like to leave the studio. I'm locked and loaded in the studio and I'm in here about 10 hours a day. And so anytime that it takes to go in the kitchen, I hate it. So my family knows I could cook, but I tell everybody else I can't. So they feed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just, well, we just had a comment. Some folks have talked about uh, being proud of you, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if you, yeah. if you have a nickname, who gave it to you? Co, uh, because I played basketball my dad used to sing um it, it used to be a song about basketball joe and so my dad turned it into basketball cup the basketball co <laughs> it's it's co though that's great i'm actually known in my circles as row so that works out <laughs> Ro and co. Ro and co. if you knew you could not fail what would you attempt robbing a bank <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I was not expecting that answer. I'm going to be honest with you. I've asked that question a lot. <laughs> that is an answer I have not received before. <laughs> We're not. We'll take um, All jokes aside, I don't, I, and this is a matter of perspective, and I know it's, it's 
it's odd to say, I don't feel like I can fail at anything because I'm trying. And that is a very stark difference from where I was in life. So I got to tell you, I honestly always feel like I'm swinging for the fence. And if I come up short, I'm really happy when I lay my head on the pillow at night. I'm okay with it. So I don't, I don't believe in failures. Um, I'll, I'll finish tomorrow if I don't finish today. I think that's a nice way to live. Last question. What are the top three things you love about living in Florida? Oh gosh. Canopy Rose. Number one. I am uh, captivated by life and the way the light peeks through the trees is, is almost dangerously mesmerizing when I'm driving. Make a sucky road. I really like the sound. I believe that you can tell a lot by a city when you go in and you're quiet in the center of town and you listen. And ours is cricket. And I, I, there's something that's very harmonic about it. it, it, it it's, it's just a quiet background noise and uh the people uh we're big enough that you don't see the same people every day but we're small enough you will see somebody you know every day so always try to make that but it's a beautiful town in that regard you can walk down any street or go to the grocery store and you're more than likely going to run into somebody that you said you know and that's that's quaint but not spiteful So I like that we're a little big city. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And I appreciate your bravery and vulnerability to speak with us so honestly and candidly. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of the Florida Ville, then please share our content on your social media. Sharing our content helps our show grow and to bring in more audience members. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Visit our website, www.thefloridaville.com to see some extras on Colette and get her contact information. Our live stream director for this episode is Joy Tootle with Rocket Ship Consultants. If you're interested in starting a live stream or podcast, email her at joy at rocketshipconsultants.com. Thanks for listening.